Hi, uh, the last assignment is simultaneous contrast and the relativity of color. And that, quite frankly, is one of the more difficult ones to do remotely. But I, I have faith that you're going to get the basic principles of what uh, it's about. And that is that color is read as color, color is perceived as color uh, because of the colors around color. In other words, there's a context to color, there are, there's an environment of color, and therefore, you're reading that color sometimes very differently because of the colors around it. For this assignment, I'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time giving you the background um, to the ideas and the concepts, the history, if you will, uh, behind this way of thinking and the kind of uh, a perceptual color attitude we'll be taking in this next assignment. Um, we're really talking about the relativity of color, and one of the pioneers in this particular field was Joseph Albers, a uh, German, who, uh, who taught at the Bauhaus, early 20th century art school. It was very, very famous and influential in all 20th century art. Uh, it was very experimental. It tried to put architecture and all the arts together under one, one house, Bauhaus. Um, and uh, because of the, the Nazis taking over in the 30s, uh, most of the faculty, in fact, the school itself was disbanded, and like many uh, Europeans, they fled to the United States. Uh, Joseph Albers, our, our subject right now, among them, he landed at Black Mountain College, which is in North Carolina, 1933 or so, and he uh, became a very influential teacher. Black Mountain is a weird place. You should look it up sometime in terms of it being a uh, kind of historic, small, radical place for the arts and humanities in the early 20th century. But, uh, but he more or less built a foundation uh, of art education for 20th century America, really concentrating on perception, really concentrating on, on uh, especially color and how we perceive color and how indeed color is affected by, um, by colors around it. Okay, Black Mountain College um, closed somewhere in the, the mid-50s, and uh, by 1960s, next 63 or so, Joseph Albers moved on to teaching uh, at Yale University. He became very influential at that high level of, of American academia. Um, he published in 1963 a book, a very famous book, called The Interaction of Color. And from that book, we're really deriving the concepts and the and the ideas and even the, the, the collage um, and juxtaposition of color uh, uh, process whereby we can see uh, how color affects color. What you'll be doing here is, um, is a kind of experimentation with your, with your color aid pack that I'll talk about uh, and you are essentially really paying attention to how uh, the colors are affecting any given color. So with his wife, Annie, Annie Albers, uh, both teaching at Black Mountain College, you have a pair of artists, uh, very influential people, who, who are almost two sides of, of the coin, the coin of uh, 20th century art education. Here's Joseph, who's a kind of, for want of a better word, a scientist of color. Uh, he was much more intuitive than that, but nonetheless, he felt that, uh, that you should be fairly objective in your perceptions, that you should begin to build art and design that was based on uh, principles that could be made theory, that could be made not necessarily rules, but but concepts to keep in mind when you're working. So he did a whole series of, of paintings that were squares upon squares upon squares, nested in squares, different colors and stripes, uh, colors that were flat and abstract, but at the same time had tremendous uh, personal, emotional power, but also, in a kind of pseudo-scientific way, a kind of close to scientific way, he was investigating how each color affected other colors. And with Annie Albers, uh, you have a consummate uh, fabric artist, uh, textile artist, uh, tapestry artist, a uh, woman who took and in some ways complemented and extended uh, Joseph Albers' theory into into wall hangings, textiles, etc. He, the, her work became not as perhaps uh, to use a cliche co as cold as as Joseph Albers' work, but but more human and livable and uh, and warm and organic. 
So this becomes a little bit of a, a scientific um, experiment in how color affects color, because we're limiting our means to, to the color aid pack. And all of you in your kit got this color aid pack, which has 314 uh, uh, sheets of color in it. And they are divided into two, two columns wrapped in these, these cardboard containers. One column is filled with intense and identifiable colors, primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, and their lightness and darkness value contrasts. The other set, the other, the other column here, the other cardboard box, has, uh, has more neutral colors, shades of those colors that are in the first one. Okay, you also get uh, a rather large number of grays that, uh, that are completely achromatic. So between these, uh, these two columns, you've got the raw material to play around with uh, experiments, okay? Perceptual experiments, whereby under control conditions, like a scientist might do, you're, uh, you're changing the perception of a color. Now that sounds kind of heavy duty and complicated and theoretical. It's not really. If you can see the colors, uh, you're able to understand what's going on. For the first particular assignment, and I'll, we'll have uh, five of them through this, through this, uh, through this uh, series, as we, I said last time, uh, you're talking about the first one, you're changing value, which as we know, we'll just go through the, um, we'll just go through the definitions quickly. Uh, you should all know them by now, but value is simply the, the lightness and darkness of the color. Intensity is the brightness and, and uh, dullness of the color. Uh, hue is actually color quality, not just a color, but, a, but it's actually a, a wavelength on the spectrum whereby you can identify a given hue, a given color. Uh, temperature is the final one, and that's the one that, uh, that, that is more subtle. You know, colors have a kind of warmth and coolness about them. I mean, you can think of uh, hot, fire, uh, lava, whatever, with oranges and yellows and reds. You can think of sky, grass, air, etc. Uh, for the cool colors, blue, green, uh, purple, if it's a blue-purple. The other thing is that, uh, that we're dealing with uh, each of these assignments addressing a given color quality or qualities in their change. And the way to do that, I think, the way to do that to make it uh, easier on you and less time consuming but more of a perceptual exercise and not w going through your color aid, ripping them and cutting them to the nth degree, making them smaller and smaller and smaller and wasting inappropriate selections, is to first just do the selections, okay? And the easiest way to do those selections would be to, if you have the, have the room spread out your color aid uh, uh, columns, okay? You don't want to separate them, you don't want to shuffle them in any way, but you do want to, to see what's there in front of you. If you have that kind of a large space, a neutral space, that's great. If not, go through them sequentially in small batches so that you see the colors in front of you. Uh, the first definition of color that we want to change by simultaneous contrast, by the backgrounds of the figure tone, and the figure tone is that, that color that's going to be changed, the backgrounds of the fields are the, are the colors that are going to change it. The first one is value. And the good thing about that is that it's relatively easy to do. It's relatively easy to do, um, and you and it really sets you up for the thinking that goes on in all the other uh, color contrasts. If you are trying to do uh, a value change, okay, in a single hue, which is number one, you would first off choose as a figure tone the the poor subject that's going to be changed in all of this, a sort of middle value. Here's a, here's a layout of, uh, of purples in your kit, and they go from dark to light. And for the first uh, selection of backgrounds, I would go, to make it really strong, to the dark, darkest and the lightest, okay, the darkest and the lightest, right, as background colors. And if we're trying to get this figure tone to change, uh, your selection of the figure tone is really as important as the backgrounds. In other words, if you're trying to get this to be dark on one side, light on the other side, then you need to, to find a, a value that's sort of in the middle, okay? Either of these might do. I suspect that this one might do better, okay? 
And if you were to put that selection horizontally across your, your two selections for the fields, for the backgrounds, and then uh, simply take either a, an upside down uh, color age sheet or one of your cardboard uh, supports for the two columns of color. Put that across as a kind of a barrier. Put that across as a kind of control. Uh, and you'll see immediately that you've made the, the right selections. For, so for the first one, if you're trying to change just the value of a color, first off I'd, ch I'd choose a color that's relatively dark and not, not light, like a purple or a blue or a green. Um, and as I said, choose a dark and a light, perhaps the most extreme, from that, that array of values you have in your first, uh, your fir your first column. Put a barrier across it and immediately you'll see uh, that there's a big color change. Now, what I'm thinking of, given our, our circumstances at a distance, is that uh, if you simply do this, photograph it as best you can, phone camera, the quality is not going to be so gr t entirely great across the, the internet, but photograph it up close as best you can, uh, and also through email, send that as an attachment, but give, it, give me the designations of the colors on the back. They each have a kind of, uh, of, of designation. So this one here is a violet VT1. What that means is it's a violet, a straightforward purple, but it's, it's a tint of violet. It's, uh, it's being, it's being uh, adjusted by adding white to it. So from the darkest of violets, it's become a little bit lighter. Okay, so uh, if you do that, in other words, photograph it just as it is, uh, and give me the two background designations, like the T1 we just saw, we saw uh, and the designation of the figure tone color that goes across, I can check with my color aid pack uh, how you're doing. So, so I can check uh, a little bit more accurately than your, than your photo. Uh, uh, if I have those sort of uh, letter and numerical designations, right? So this is, this is the basic principle of all of these. It gets a little bit more complicated, but this is the basic principle. If you want to change something in the figure tone, you do the exact opposite in the, in the uh, fields. Okay, so the second one we're going to be dealing with is intensity, okay? The, uh, the intensity uh, change is going to be, as we know through the defin definitions, the brightness, the purity, the absolutely uh, uh, saturated strength of a color, the fire engine up against the brick wall, as I keep saying, the, the red, bright red fire engine that's up against a wall that might be red, but a kind of brown red, okay? And uh, uh, if you do that, it becomes a little bit more complicated in terms of, in terms of not just using two versions of the same color in back, but using a version of the color that's the figure tone and its complement. Its complement. Its complement. So the opposite color, I'm going to have to look at here. If, you, if I'm trying to change a red from a dull red to, a, to an intense red, okay, the two backgrounds I would use would be a bright red okay, to, to sort of bully and make more um, weak the figure tone red. And then not another kind of red, but but it's opposite in the fact that it's going to be its complement. You know, the complements are those pairs of colors in the color wheel that are opposite one another. So as you know, uh, red and green, orange and blue, and yellow and purple. Those will bring out the intensities of each one of those pairs uh, if you put them side by side. So I've got a, f uh, a background um, arrangement here that's going to be the, color, the bright version of the color I'm trying to change, and then it's opposite on the color wheel, uh, a green. And notice, I think, that you, this green is not just a bright green. It's a, it's a duller green, and that would be found in your second more, uh, more uh, neutral pack of colors, that, that one column of, of colors that are more or less uh, earth tones and a little bit off the intense versions of the hues that you have in your first pack. So I'm doing a double whammy here. I've got a bright version of the, of the figure tone, okay, as the background, a bright red, and then the absolute opposite of that, that color 
it's green, but I've also chosen a green that is dull, and that will make for more contrast. Remember, whatever you want to change in the figure tone, you do the opposite in the, in the ground. So therefore, if this is a dull green, it gives a kind of double whammy to push the, the red towards a more intense red. So let's see what happens if I put this, this uh, red across the two figure tones, excuse me, across the, the two grounds, and I put, as I'm doing here most efficiently, you know, one of your cardboards or even the backside of the, any, any other color aid sheet, if you put it across there, you see immediately that this guy gets obliterated, very neutral. In relation to the color in back of it, it is not very strong. It's barely visible. This, however, becomes a brilliant, contrasted, uh, intense version of the hue. Therefore, you've changed the intensity from a very neutral, almost hard to see uh, red to a red that is brilliant and intense and saturated. So, in our third simultaneous contrast change, I'm asking you to, believe it or not, change the hue, the very color of the figure tone. And that becomes uh, easier if you are really careful about what you choose for the figure tone. In other words, if you choose a primary color, a yellow or a red or a blue, there's no chance it's going to change with the background. Those are two strong and two primary colors. Uh, However, if you choose a secondary or what's called a tertiary color, a mixture of a couple of colors in different proportions, you have a better chance of changing the hue itself. So uh, like a red purple or a blue green or a yellow orange or a red orange, those kinds of wishy-washy Goldilocks in between colors are easier to change if you back them with what? Back them with the colors that go into making that color. So, in this one here, you have a kind of red-purple, okay? It's got purple, it's got red, and uh, what you do for the background, and these are the, the, the ones with, uh, with the flips. You don't have to do that, but it, it, it shows you what's going on with the figure tone in the grounds. Here, the two triangular figure tones are changing into red and purple because the backgrounds are simply those two colors uh, pushing the color, the figure tone, into its opposite. So remember that the dynamics of all of this is that whatever you want to change in the figure tone, you do the opposite in the ground. Another one that's fairly straightforward and easy to see, uh, a kind of blue-green, okay, a green-blue, okay, blue and green, making up that hue quality. You open it up with different backgrounds and so logically, so obviously, the green and the blue backgrounds push the figure tone to the other color. And you can see that strongly in this one here. Uh, they don't have to be necessarily warm and cool colors. Uh, they can be uh, entirely a warm or a cool color. Look at this orange, okay? Uh, a sideways uh, flap here, it doesn't matter. Um, that's a strong orange, probably a, an orange that's got got a bit of uh, red in it as well. And I'll open it up, and indeed you get that, okay? If you've got, if you've got yellow and orange, excuse me, yellow and red making orange, then that kind of orange with a bit of red in it uh, becomes strong red on this side with the, the yellow in back, and orange on this side with the red in back. So with your, with your format that's the easier one, that we've We've talked about it in another video with just your, your putting uh, a horizontal figure tone across and two backgrounds that are the ones you've chosen. So with these uh, hue changes, you can experiment galore fairly easily with, uh, with those uh, color changes. And if you put that, that barrier between them, here I've got the cardboard from your color aid set. You have a, a ready-made and, uh, and simple way to determine whether it's working or not. And again, what I'm asking for in this particular assignment is for you to just uh, uh, photograph it like this. You don't have to build the flap. Uh, and then send me 
with de with uh, identification, the uh, the background, uh, the back colors, the back letters and numbers of each of the the um, each of the okay <laughs> each thank you uh, each of the color aid pa uh, pieces. The next simultaneous contrast uh, uh, experiment we're going to do has to do with taking the uh, figure tone and taking that color, making it an entirely different uh, color in all dimensions. In other words, not just uh, one or two as we've done in the past, but, but changing it completely in the four dimensions of, of hue, value, intensity, and temperature. And it sounds kind of uh, uh, difficult, a challenge, but it, it really, in terms of the in terms of your choosing your colors in, in, as the figure tone in the background, it's relatively straightforward and logical. In other words, again, like we've done in, in some of the past, we, we're taking a figure tone as this one here. This one happens to be a kind of blue, green, green, blue, okay, with two colors in it. And it's also, if you noticed, a kind of in-between value. It is not too dark, not too light, all right? So you've got a kind of uh, uh, in-between color, a mixture of colors for your figure tone, and its value especially uh, is, is not too dark, not too, not too light, because one of the things we're changing is value. If you think about your grounds okay, that are going to change the figure tone, uh, the best way to think about it is that if one side is one color, the other side has to be another color. If one side is war warm, the other side is cool. If one side is dark, the other side is light, etc., etc. One side intense, this one here. The other side, not so intense. So uh, if, you, if you choose your grounds so that they are two opposites in all dimensions, and it doesn't matter how you mix and match them. You know, it just that if it's light on one side, it's got to be darker on the other side. Uh, if it's cooler on this side, it's got to be warmer on this side. Intense on one side, less intense on the other side. And we'll see what happens when we put this sort of in-between figure tone across it, and hopefully, voila, we've got, wow, we've got some dramatic differences in both sides. If we look at it carefully, uh, you see that this one is darker, that one is lighter. This one is blue, that one is green. This one is more intense, that one is less intense. This one's cooler, that one's warmer, but by virtue of it being the green. And there are some other things here that show you other examples. Again, in the, in the flap that you don't have to do, in the, in the uh, uh, control swatch that you don't have to do for this assignment. Uh, I'm just asking you to do this much and send it to me in a, in a, in a uh, photo. But here, you've got uh, much the same thing. You had a, a kind of reddish purple, a kind of warm purple, right? And you've moved it to uh, one side being, in terms of the, the, the background, again, much like the other one, uh, an intense dark blue, uh, a lighter uh, orange, equal intensity. Maybe this is the less intense. That's more intense. But lighter, darker, cooler, warmer, that that figure tone across them becomes a kind of, of lighter value, purple, this a darker value, blue, this a less intense purple, that a more intense blue. So all of the, the color qualities are changing. If indeed you find a kind of in-betweeny for the figure tone and extreme opposites, doesn't matter how you mix and match them, but if you've got opposite qualities on each side of that divide, you're, you're, you're in business. Here's a slightly different one with uh, what seems to be, if we put the flap down on this one, a kind of red with a bit of purple in it, all right? So uh, again, we've got warm versus cool, dark versus light, intense versus neutral. Uh, as long as each of the sides has uh, a, different a different version of the quality, contrasting quality of each of the four uh, color qualities we've talked about. Uh, hue, temperature, value, and intensity.
Okay, we now do the last uh, simultaneous contrast, which strangely enough is going to use a gray figure tone. In other words, the miracle of this one is that you're going to inject color into a colorless, um, a colorless figure tone. So if I open this one here, and again, this is the color swatch thing you don't have to construct, but it's a good example of what happens to a gray uh, in, in colored grounds. This is a kind of middle gray, okay? As you can see with the flap down, it's, it's completely gray. And although uh, you're using gray, a colorless uh, figure tone, it, the process of this is very much like number four. In other words, where you took a colored figure tone and changed it completely in all dimensions. Here, you're taking the gray and changing it in all dimensions. In this example here of the small diamond on the fields, you've got two uh, grounds that are, in, that, are, that are different in many di dimensions. Uh, they're not terribly strong in terms of intensity differences. Maybe this is more intense than that. But nonetheless, they're, they're really injecting a lot of change in that gray. And you can see how, because this is orange and this is blue, uh, you get in the gray, uh, the orange injecting its complement blue into the, into the gray. In this one, you get uh, the blue injecting a warmth at least, at least a kind of warmth, whether it's orange or not. You're changing the temperature uh, somewhat in this, in this gray figure tone. So just as you played with the grounds in number four, change them in every direction, okay? Every dimension. Uh, and if you choose a middle gray, a gray that is indeed in, in close to the center of your many uh, grays in your color aid pack, you'll be in business to change the, the, the value as well as, the, uh, as, well as the, the other dimensions of color. So here, you'd start, again, with, uh, with two very different sorts of, of backgrounds. Choosing a gray that seems to come from the middle of your pack of maybe 20 or so uh, in your color aid pack. I'm putting it across these two, okay? And although it's not gonna be as small as that diamond in the previous one, you'll still get a strong sense of how they change if you leave a lot, as in the other ones, you leave a lot of the, the grounds surrounding the figure tone. So I'm gonna do something like this. And yes, you know, you do say, it. see, it's not as strong as the other one because the figures are bigger, but nonetheless it's successful because this seems to be warmer, if not greener. This seems to be cooler, if not bluer, okay? This seems to be lighter. Uh, this seems to be darker. Uh, the intensity is a bit subtle, but I'd say this one is perhaps a bit more intense than the other one. Uh, values are different. Uh, temperatures are different, certainly, because this one is warmer and that's cooler. So this is going to be a tough one to get a striking example, but I'd like you to go through it anyway, despite uh, you know the subtlety that you're going to end up with because of the, the not cutting these things into smaller figure tones. Go through it to get a sense of uh, how even a colorless patch of art and design can be injected with subtle color by the color that's around it.